Well, everybody, welcome to Romans chapter 9. We are getting to start a very difficult section of te uh, text, uh, more widely Romans 9 through chapter 11. Three chapters that have a lot of meat in there and a lot of things in there for us to get into. Uh, it's a, a whole new section, and it's, I suppose you could handle it separately or independently if you wanted to there are some commentators that think this is just a parenthesis in the book of Romans because you could end with chapter 8 and then go straight to chapter 12 and not really miss a whole lot you go from doctrine and the gospel to practical things but but not the way Paul wrote it he wrote chapters 9 through 11 for us to dig into and it could stand by itself, but I think the only way you're ever really going to understand, uh, the only possible way that you'll make sense of these chapters is understanding what Paul has already said to us in the gospel up to now, 1 through 8. Specifically, what he recently just said in chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. For those God has chosen for himself, whom he foreknew, and whom he called according to his own purpose to save for himself, and who subsequently believe him and love him for all of those, they are guaranteed glorification. They are guaranteed to be conformed to the image of his son. All of us who are called according to his purpose, who believe in him and love him, will be like Jesus Christ. Everyone who believes. Our security of salvation is because God will not let anything come and separate us from his love. That's what we studied in chapter 8 just last week. Nothing can separate us from his love. It is a secure salvation. It is, it is going to happen. There's nothing that can mess it up. But just like the other places in the book of Romans, whenever Paul is d discussing elements of the gospel, he anticipates and deals with objections that, sh that come up. Like, for example, um, this superabounding grace. If you have superabounding grace that covers every sin, what is the logical conclusion that you would likely think? Well, for chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. But that is an objection to the gospel of grace. If you get grace, then you're going to think, I can just sin and I'm going to get grace because it's a superabounding grace. It's more than you can possibly ever get. Verse 15, chapter 6. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Those are objections that people bring up against the gospel, and Paul deals with them. Here, in chapter 9, you have another objection to the doctrine of God's purpose to save. A purpose that cannot be thwarted, a purpose that cannot go away. God purposes to save, and it is a secure purpose purpose it is a secure salvation but this purpose includes with it according to the gospel uh, that Paul preached in Romans includes the Gentiles in fact the Gentiles are the majority of those who believe they are most of the believers are Gentiles now if his people are eternally secure and if his salvation is planned and secured by his purpose then here's the question that's going to come up in people's minds especially some people what about the Jews? What about those who are, who are Israelites? What happened to them? Why are the Jews so resistant to the gospel? If God's purpose can't fail, if God's plan to save can't fail, why has it not worked on the Jews as a whole, as a nation, as an ethnic group, as genetic children of Abraham? Why has it failed? Or weren't they God's chosen people? Weren't they? Why are they not believers? The Messiah came to them and they rejected him. If the gospel of Jesus Christ is offered salvation to the Gentiles, God must have somehow forsaken and forgot about or put into a, um, off to the side Israel. 
How can that be? That's a major problem. And it's not just a major problem because of the gospel. It's a major problem for God. So many Jews would hear Paul preach his gospel message, and they're going to conclude, because of this doctrine of justification by faith alone, this new idea is valid only for Gentiles. And if it's valid only for Gentiles, then the Jews are out. Israel's out. Israel's gone. God must have somehow messed up here. God has failed to keep his promise to Abraham. That's a real serious objection. If the gospel is true, God has a problem. Something is messed up. God has made an error. God has failed. And I know that's what what the problem is in Romans chapter 9 because of what Paul says in this key verse, which we won't get to today, I promise, or maybe not even next week, I promise. But it's only in verse 6. He says, it's not as though God's word has failed. See, he's answering it already. It's, it, we're talking about God's word being on trial here. We have to get God off the hook. We must be able to justify God and his ways if the gospel is going to remain intact because of the Jews, because of Israel. And Paul shows us here in chapters 9, 10, and 11 how God's plan is happening the way It was always supposed to be happening. That's what Romans 9, 10, and 11 are. God's plan is happening just the way it was always supposed to be happening. That's what it's all about. In fact, this is called theological truth. It's called a theodicy. I know you've never heard that word before because I heard it uh, again, and I had to, oh, Lord, what does that word mean? It means justification of God. God has to be vindicated here. God is on trial here, and his ways must be justified. His ways must be declared to be right. And what it looks like right now, because the Jews have rejected the gospel, that his ways are not right. That's what it looks like. If Israel, if the Jews have wholesale rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, how can you not say that God has failed? How can you you not say it? We're talking about a real theological problem. Not one that's made up. Not one with an easy answer. A difficult answer. A tough answer. To those who object now, God is the one on trial. Israel rejected the gospel. Did God not see that coming? Did God not see... uh, um, that Israel was going to do this, and did he forget about them? Has he cast them off? Has he changed his mind? Is he now in plan B? See, that drives me nuts whenever I hear God's in plan B. What happened to Israel? Plan A has Israel failing. And yet God promised a lot of things to Abraham. How can that be? Y'all with me? That's the problem we're dealing with in chapter 9, 10, and 11. We have to justify God. That is where Paul's going, and I know that's where Paul's going because in each of these three chapters, he starts off with things like this. Chapters, verse 3 and 4, which we'll get to. The sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. That's what he's saying. I'm talking about my people, Jews. Chapter 10, verse 1. My heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Israel, Jews, ethnic Jews with geopolitical boundaries, Jews. Romans 11, verse 1, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. He's talking about Israel. We have to deal with Israel and how Israel fits into God's plan. And if it fits into God's plan, is it, was it always that plan? Is God off the hook now? We've got to get him off or else he's messed up. We can't have that. That's where Paul is going. What about Israel? How has God not failed? And what will happen with Israel? So let's start and see how far we can get. Uh, I I might be able to get, who knows. I'm going to read the first five verses. Uh, I won't get all five of these verses today. I'm going to read them all. Verses 1 through 5. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. 
My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. There's a lot in that paragraph right there. Let's start. Paul begins by giving us some positive and some negative affirmations. He is making some statements to us, both positively and negatively. Verse 1, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm speaking the truth. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. So here he is making a positive statement. I'm telling you the truth. And he's making a negative statement. I'm not lying. And he invokes upon that truth statement positively and negatively, Jesus Christ, his own conscience, and the Holy Spirit. A serious statement. What he is about to say, because he uses all of these words to say, I've got to tell you something that's true, I'm not lying, it's Christ is in it, my conscience is in it, and the Holy Spirit is in it. He is emphasizing that what he's about to tell us in the next verse is true. Way true. Very emphatic. Like he's taking an oath or something. Like, I swear, this is the truth. His appeal is in Christ. As one who is in union with Christ, as one who is one with him, as one who is a member of his body, the church, as one who is a believer and saved and and is in Jesus Christ, as one who is in the presence of Jesus Christ, Christ himself is now being invoked to confirm what Paul is saying is truth. Paul does this a lot in several places. I'll give you a couple. He calls God as his witness. For Romans chapter 1, verse 9. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness. How constantly I remember you. Well, if I tell you I remember you all the time, you don't know if it's true until I say, I swear to God it's true. He confirms with me that it's true. He is my witness that it's true. I'm not lying to you. He says it in 2 Corinthians 1, 23. I call God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. I was so mad that if I had come to Corinth, we would have had a bad day. But I'm telling you, God is my witness. It was to spare you all of that heartache that I didn't come. Ask God. He'll tell you. So Paul invokes Christ, the presence of Christ, union with Christ, as a witness to the testimony that what he's about to say to us is true. He also invokes his own conscience. I want to chase a little bitty rabbit here. We're not going to go as deep as you can, but I want to go a little bit. His conscience confirms it. His conscience bears witness with him that what he's about to tell us is true. You know what the conscience is, right? It's a psychological faculty which distinguishes between good and and evil, right and wrong. And God has put that in each one of us here. A moral sensitivity, a moral compass to warn us when something's wrong and to commend us when something's right. It's inside. You know something's wrong, you know something's right. And when you do wrong, you have a guilty conscience. When you do right, you feel good about yourself. That's your conscience. It's happening. And this is very important to Paul that he would have a clear and good conscience about everything he did or said or whatever he did. I imagine this is one of his biggest personality quirks. Not really a personality quirk, a character trait, if you will. He just wanted it to feel good to himself that what he was saying was true. I want to have... Uh, I want to be honest here. I want to keep my integrity here. My conscience is keeping me strong and true before you. He says this a lot, Acts 24, 16. Um, I strive to keep my conscience clear before God and man. That's the way Paul thought about himself. I want my conscience to be clear whatever I say. Acts 23, verse 1, Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. 
He's not condemning himself. He's not judging himself. He's not making himself feel bad because he didn't do everything he could or would have, should have done. His conscience is clear. He's working to serve God as best he can, fulfilling his duty. It says in 2 Corinthians 1, verse, 2, verse 12, This is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you in holiness and sincerity that are from God. My conscience is clear that when I was with you guys, I was holy. I lived a right life, and I, I was sincere as I can be. I didn't come out with any schemes. I didn't have any angle. I just came with a clear conscience to serve God for you. That's what Paul means by all of this. To have a good conscience. To have no conflicting moral crisis in his soul. As sincerely as he can possibly be. That's what a good conscience is. You're sincere about what you did or didn't do. And your conscience isn't condemning you or making you feel guilty for it. And, and it's commending you when you did it right. Having a good conscience. This is a principle that we should really try to live by. And it's not foolproof. I'll show you that in a minute. But do not violate your conscience. Don't go against your conscience. If something's not right and you know it, because you do know it. You know that, right? You know when it's wrong to say something that's wrong. Don't say it. Don't do it. You know when it's good and when it's right to do something that's right. Do it. You already know that. God gave you a conscience for that. A moral compass of moral sensitivity to discern right and wrong and to do right and wrong. Or to, not, to do right and not do wrong. And when you do right, you feel good. And when you do wrong, you feel bad. Because your conscience hurts. But if you violate your conscience enough times and you just keep doing what you know you're not supposed to do or keep saying what you know you're not supposed to say, you really are going to mess your life up and somebody else's life up too. Regularly. In fact, some people sear their conscience where they can't even tell what's right and wrong anymore. Like, you ever wonder like a mafia hitman? Like, how can he do that? And he's done it so many times, it doesn't even bother him anymore that he kills somebody. Or any of the collateral damage that goes with it. Doesn't even bother him. Or a prosperity preacher who preaches the same sermon and rips people off of their last dime of seed money. And he keeps doing it. Next week he'll be doing it too. Doesn't he feel guilty about that? That lady doesn't have anything else to live on. She gave it all to you because you told her God was going to bless her if she did. So many times manipulating people and ripping them off that it doesn't even bother you anymore? Some people do that. Paul said it this way, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. The Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They just keep saying the false doctrine over and over again. It doesn't even bother them anymore that they're preaching false doctrine. Their conscience is seared. Titus 1.15, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. So if you just keep violating your conscience, good or bad, whatever you're not supposed to be doing, you do, and whatever you're not supposed to be doing, you keep doing over and over again until you violate your conscience and sear it, it's going to be messed up. Don't be like that. Now, there are other factors involved. There are things like weak consciences, and we could spend the whole sermon on the conscience. Way more than we have time to explore today. But Paul says, my conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. What I'm about to say to you, I'm telling you the truth. I am not lying in Christ, and my conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. And he says, the Spirit is the one who is the most important element here. He is prompting me either to condemn or to approve of what I'm about to say. The Spirit is who he lives by, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
Paul is living according to the Spirit, and the, cons- and the Spirit is confirming to him that what he's going to tell us next is true. Because it also says this too, even though I just got through saying don't violate your conscience, your conscience isn't perfect either. We are fallen creatures living in a fallen world, and sometimes we think something's right and it's not right. Some of that has to do with how we were raised, we were misguided, we were experiencing something wrong, or we had ignorance, we were trained a certain way. There are things that people believe are wrong, and they're really hardcore about it. And if you tell them they're wrong, if you tell them they're wrong, they're going to get upset. But really, they are wrong. It's not wrong to do that. But their conscience won't let them do it. That's a weak conscience. But there's also people who think things are okay to do, but they're not really okay to do, but their conscience isn't condemning them because they think it's okay because of the way they were taught or what they experienced in their life. But the Holy Spirit confirms to Paul that his conscience is true to what he is going to tell us. And the reason why this has got to be the case because the things Paul is about to tell us, what he's going to say to us, are to us seem like very strong exaggerations. Unbelievable things. There's no way Paul could be telling me the truth about what he's going to say. Unless it's in Christ His conscience is confirming it, and the Holy Spirit is confirming it. Things like this. Verse 2, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Now here's Paul. What's one of the things you you think about Paul when you read his letters? He writes a lot about what? Joy. Rejoicing. In Romans it's rejoicing. We rejoice in our sufferings. Man, the dude's happy all the time. He's rejoicing. He's full of joy. Here he, he's sad. That's what the word means, sorrow. He is sad. It means distressed. And it uses this Greek word, megos. We get our English word, mega. It means greatly distressed. Intense sorrow. Intense sadness. And he uses the, another word very similar to the word anguish. It means pain, distress, woe. Here's Paul saying, I, am in, I have great sorrow and I have anguish. I have woe. I have pain. I have sorrow. I am distressed. I am in pain. I am grieved. That's what he means. And he has this other word connected to it. Constant, unceasing, nonstop, all the time. Anybody want to volunteer for that kind of life? All the time, unceasing, unstoppable, constant sorrow. The same Apostle Paul who writes about rejoicing the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. The same Apostle Paul that says we rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in our salvation. All of those phrases. Here he's saying he's sad. He is His emotions are held hostage by his sadness. That's what he means. That's exactly what he means. And he's sad for this reason. He's held hostage in his emotions, in his sadness, in his sorrow, in his anguish, in his grief by the Jews. He's bummed out because of the Jews. He says it, verse 3 and 4, For the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people Israel. And he's sad because of the people Israel. His people, the Jews, Israel, because most of them, the majority of them, the vast majority of them are lost and don't believe the gospel. said it a while ago. Their Messiah came to them and they rejected him. Paul's own people, his people, the Jews, They rejected the Messiah. They have not believed the gospel. They anticipated the Messiah to come, and the minute he showed up, when he came, they refused to believe in him. And that's a serious bummer for Paul. And he expresses it using extreme hyperbole. Hyperbole is is like an exaggeration except on steroids. Verse 3 and 4, For I wish, or for I could wish, that I myself were cursed, and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Now, 
Theologically, what Paul is saying right there is really impossible for a true believer, a true Christian to say or do. You cannot forfeit your salvation and go to hell for somebody else's sake. You can't do it. You can't even say you want to do it. In fact, that's not what Paul says. He uses in the Greek, it's called imperfect tense. I don't even know if we have that in English. says, I could wish. It's the best way to say it. I could wish. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, I could almost wish. A hyperbole. I, if I could, I would. I know I can't, but if I could, this is what I would wish for. And the word wish is the same word that's translated everywhere else, pray. I would pray this way. Lord, send me to hell if it would save them. That's heavy stuff. In, the, in his emotional state of mind concerning Israel, this is what he thinks. The ethnic people Israel, the Jewish people, his people. Paul is over the top in love with them. He loves his own race. He loves the same nation. That, that's what he means by his people, the same nation, his fellow countrymen, Israel, Jews. He loves them so much that he says, I could wish, if it were possible, that I would be cursed and cut off if it would save them. There's an Old Testament parallel. Um, the only other place something like this is even in the Bible. And Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, and down below they were uh, making a golden calf, and selling all their jewelry and earrings and stuff, and making a golden calf, and they were worshiping and doing all kinds of crazy wild things. And when Moses came down and saw that, and God was angry, and God... Uh, they. Some guys got their swords and killed, what, 3,000 of them that same day? God was angry, and Moses prayed to God. He says, but now, please forgive their sin, but if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. You want to go, who does stuff like that? Who says that to God? If you're not going to save them, then don't save me. Moses is pretty serious talking to God like that saying, God, if you don't save these people, don't save me. If you're not going to forgive them, don't forgive me. Blot me out. That's very serious. And Paul means the same thing here. He is very serious. He means it. And he has to mean it because here's Paul preaching the gospel of justification by faith alone, apart from the law, apart from any works of the law, which is a slam on who? The Jews. And he goes and he hangs out with the Gentiles all the time, and he's eating ham sandwiches and BLT and barbecue hash. He's playing with the Gentiles all the time. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. And all of these Jews who hear him preach this gospel are going, he's done abandoning us. He hates us. He's going and... His best friends are Gentiles now. He hangs out with Gentiles all the time. He's abandoned Judaism. He's abandoned Israel. He's abandoned his people. That's why he has to say stuff like, I speak the truth I, in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears witness with me and confirms it with me by the Holy Spirit that what I'm saying is true. I love Israel so much that it makes me sad sorrowful, unceasing, because they're lost. And if you were a Jew and heard Paul say some of the things he has actually said about the Jews, you would think that too. You know what he wrote in 2 Thessalonians? This is like his third letter he ever wrote. This is way before the book of Romans. And you know there were Jews who read this. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those ch churches, the churches in Judea, suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and, and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking the, to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. What does he say about the, Gentile, the Jews? They displease God. He's talking about Jews. He says, in this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. He's talking about Jews. Paul writes that. Now what would you think if you were a fellow Jew? 
He hates us. But that's his conviction about the Jews and their rejection of Christ. But he's telling the truth. It breaks his heart that they're enemies of the cross. It breaks his heart that they're enemies of Christ. It breaks his heart that they are lost and don't believe. And they reject the gospel. It disturbs him all the time. Unceasing, constant, nonstop anguish. That's what he says. He says it in uh, Acts chapter 20, 19, where he's talking to the Ephesian elders. He says, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears. And by tears, he means this. Although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews, the Jews are my people, and they're attacking me. And it made him sad that the Jews are the ones attacking him. With tears. This is a crying apostle. This is an apostle who cries all the time. Sad. He loves his people so much that he could wish, if that were possible or somehow allowed to happen, that he would be cursed and cut off from Christ for their sake. The word cursed and cut off is one word in the Greek. It's anathema. You've heard that word before? That's the Greek word. It means cursed. I wish I were cursed. I would wish, I could wish, I would be cursed for their sake, my people. If somehow it would save them from God's condemnation, I would take it. No, I don't know I would ever be able to say something like that or even think something like that. Paul's love for his fellow Jews was indeed this strong, so much that he's willing to abandon his own salvation so that they might be saved. If that were possible. Now, I have to say it again, he is speaking in extreme hyperbole here. He is over the top giving us the maximum effect of what he means. He is intensely exaggerating what he's really saying. Because this is not the true wish of any Christian. And it's not even possible that even if you did go to hell for somebody, that that would save them. Because you have no power to save them by going to hell. Theologically. So Paul knows this. He's just saying, if it were possible for this to happen, I would do it if it would save them. That's how much I love them. That's how much I care about them. They make me sad that they reject the gospel. And the reason why it's, not something that a true Christian would really truly say is because of this. You know how you became a Christian in the first place? Jew or Gentile. You were convicted by the Holy Spirit about your sin. You saw your sin as what was going to condemn you to hell. You were the one under judgment. The Holy Spirit has shown you that your sin is what your condemnation is about. The Holy Spirit showed you Jesus Christ and his death on the cross as the payment for your sin. And you saw that you needed him. You saw that he was the only way you could ever be saved. That the curse was on you, and your personal condemnation was coming on you. And you realized you needed Christ, and so you called on him to save you. That's how anyone gets saved, ever. So you're not the kind of person who, well, I'm, I'm a sinner and I'm going to go to hell unless Jesus saves me. Jesus saved me. Now I wish I weren't saved for their sake. No one says that. Because you cried out to Jesus in the first place so he would save you. And theologically, this is impossible too. You can't be cursed right after you are in Christ. After you're in Christ. That's what Romans 8 was about. What? Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Neither angels nor demons nor uh, height nor depth or anything in all creation. You can't be separated. It's impossible. But what he means is, what I've already said, his heart is broken for them because they're lost. His heart is broken for his own people, the Israelites, the Jews, the ethnic Jews, children of, Israel, children of Abraham are lost, and it breaks his heart. He tells us in Chapter 10, verse 1, I read this a while ago. My brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. That's, that's Paul's heart. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. 
I'm sad all the time, unceasing anguish, sorrow and pain and grief because of my countrymen, my fellow Jews are lost. They do not believe the gospel. Now what I want to do for the rest of our time today is uh, see if we can just hurt your feelings a little bit. I confess this is very convicting to me. When have you ever been burdened this way for lost people? Have you? Has, has your heart ever been broken so bad that someone you know, someone you love, someone you care about, someone you want in your life all the time is lost and will suffer eternally in hell? Does it bother you? Are you sad? Does it make you cry? Because someone you love, especially someone you love. Now, I have some evangelist friends. They cry about everybody. But I'm talking about us. We have family members. We have neighbors. We have uh, husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, cousins, uncles, aunts, grandparents who are lost. People that we've loved our whole lives. I mean, we love them. They're our people. And they don't believe the gospel. Does it burden you and make you sad that people you love are lost? Does it make you sad that people that you love will perish eternally? Or do you even believe that? Because people without Christ will suffer eternal condemnation in a fiery, dark hell. And it, they never get out. Never. Does that bother you? I, this is truly, I, I mean, I'm telling you, I'm convicted myself. I don't even know why I'm the one preaching it. But this is the true test of where you are spiritually. How do you feel about lost souls? Does your heart break with concern and sadness for people who will die and go to hell without Christ? See, this is the way Paul was. And he wasn't just this way with the Jews, although the Jews were his people and it really bothered him. He was in unceasing anguish. He was in a constant state of sadness and super depression because his people were lost. But he was this way about a lot of people. He says to the Philippians, For as, as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. See, uh, we are a good church. We are a sound church. We have correct doctrine. If you believe what I preach, then you have correct doctrine. Because I'm right. And we're right. Are we not? That's not what this is really about. That's good. I'm glad we're that way. Not having sound doctrine. Not just having the truth of the gospel in our ears all the time. This is about having a, a care for the souls of men. Being sad. Having great sorrow. Unceasing anguish for those who will never enjoy the glory that we're going to see and have forever. Sad. Bummed out. Depressed, not because a new bill came in the mail, but depressed because someone you love is going to go to hell. Not that we're irritated or aggravated or disgusted or bitter or con, uh, contemptuous or combative with them either. Now, I admit, a lot of unbelievers, even people in your family, irritate the snot out of you. So when you go to the Thanksgiving reunion, you're like, oh, brother, here we go again. I admit that's true. But I don't mean those attitudes. I mean sad. At least those who are closest to you. Husbands who have lost wives, wives who have lost husbands, should be grieved, sad. Parents who have lost children, children who have lost parents, should be sad. 
extended families, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents. I'm not talking about just people you don't know when you walk past them on the street. I'm talking about people who you've known your whole life. You play with them. You like them. Your neighbors. We would grieve if we took this to heart. We'd be just like Paul. It, w- it, would, it would cause you to have anguish. And does it not? I admit it's not easy. I said that. Because many people that you love are antagonistic to the gospel and to you. Because you believe the gospel. They are antagonistic to you. But still, Paul is extremely sad all the time because his fellow countrymen, the Jews, are lost. And we should be sad all the time because our families, our friends, our loved ones are lost. It should also affect the way we pray for them too. Like, Father, uh, save my brother, save my sister, Please, save my children, save my parents, save my cousins, save my soulmate friends. I mean soulmate friends, I mean these are like bosom friends. These are guys you like a lot and they're lost. Save them. Lord, Father, give them eyes to see Christ so they can see his glory and they'll be drawn to him. Father, take them out of the kingdom of darkness and place them into the kingdom of your son, the kingdom of light. Father, I pray, God, that you would just give them a new heart of flesh, take out their heart of stone. Prayers like that would be the first thing to come out of your mouth if you were sad that people who you love are going to go to hell. That's what you'd be praying. It would affect the way you prayed. It'll change the actual way you view people and treat them. Because you know, unless God opens their eyes, they will never see. And you used to be blind until God opened your eyes. So we're not coming at, at, at people who, we, who are lost and are going to perish eternally from an arrogant point of view, from a, wow, aren't you dumb and not as smart as me because you didn't believe what I believed the only reason you got saved was because God was gracious to you there's nothing about you that makes you better than anyone else not a thing you're no better than anybody you're no better than the worst sinner out there so knowing that people are going to perish and it makes you sad that they're going to perish It would cause you to be humble toward lost people. That's what you are when you're sad about people going to hell. You're you're humble. You have compassion for them. You have gentleness for them. You have respect for them. You have kindness toward them. Not cocky. Not boastful. Not holier than thou. Not self-righteous. Not anything like that. Just humility. Humility. You've already been crying before you even talk to them. You don't immediately go from crying to, hey, y'all dummies. You're sad. And, you know, we'll get into this too. Romans 9, the doctrine of election, it's coming heavy. We're about to get into some verses that's going to blow our minds. But just because you believe the doctrine of election cannot stop you from grieving at people who are lost. Paul's the one that's writing it down. And he's the one sad. Stuff like that. This is heavy. Also, it affects your missionary zeal too, your evangelism. Think about this too. If you truly were like Paul and you were willing to go to hell eternally so that somebody else that you love might be saved if that was really your heart you really were wishing could wishing that you could be a curse for their sake it would seem to me that anything else anything else i don't care what it is pick something i don't care what you pick it's got to be way of a lesser burden than be perishing forever there would be nothing you would do not do to try to win them to christ 
Nothing. Nothing's worse than that. You've already done the greatest, hardest thing there was possibly to do. Could wishing you would perish. Could wishing that you would be cursed. Do you think going across the room and sharing the gospel with them is worse than that? Do you think that telling the good news and spending your time and your energy and your resources and your money to get the gospel into their ears over and over and over again as many times as you can before they die and face judgment, do you think that's going to be a problem for you? No. Why would it be? I've already wished or could wish I would be a curse for their sake. Nothing's worse than that. Give me some evangelism to do with my family, with my loved ones, with my cousins. Stuff like that. Getting the gospel to them would be the only thing that mattered, right? Does that make sense? This is, Paul's a heavy-duty evangelist here, and it starts with his sadness. He says this in 2 Timothy 2.10, talking about election. I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Now, only the elect are really going to be saved. But he says, I do everything for their sake. That means suffer punishment, suffer persecution, have uh, insults, all these kind of hard things, shipwrecks, everything he talked about in 2 Corinthians 11, all of those things, I'll suffer anything, I'll endure anything and everything for their sake, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Nothing else matters. I'll endure anything that the gospel might come out of my mouth and tell it to them and they be saved. Now, I don't want to spiritualize the text too, mi- too much, but many people have used this uh, verse in Psalm 126, a metaphor of agriculture to speak about evangelism. And I think it's a good picture 126 verses 5 and 6, it says, Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, I meant to do that. He who goes out weeping, carrying his seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Now surely it's a metaphor, and Jesus used this metaphor of sowing seed, of spreading the word, in Matthew 13. But if you're sad when you do it, if your heart is broken for the people who are lost that you're trying to tell the good, good news to, God's going to reward that. God gave Paul a great harvest of souls. The, the Gentile world. Everywhere he went, large numbers of people believed. Now, they weren't Jews, but some did. I'm finished. I just want to say before uh, we close, if you have never seen Jesus crucified for your sins, if you have never looked to him on the cross as being the one who satisfied God's wrath for you, and you have never called on him to save you, I hope you'll see him today. And I hope you'll call on him today. I hope you will trust him today and believe him today. That he'll take away your guilt and will give you a heart for your family, for those closest to you. Believe him. Pray with me. Father God, I do praise you for your word. I praise you that you have been merciful to us to let us hear it. I praise you, Father, because of your grace. You saved us. You gave us eyes to see your son hanging on the tree for us. I praise you that you gave us hearts of flesh that would call on him and believe him. But Lord, as we have looked at today, there are many, many people in our lives. Some of them, Lord, we care about deeply. We love. And they don't know you, and they will die and go to hell. They will die and be punished eternally. They will die and be condemned unless you save them. So, Father, I pray 
implant into our minds and our hearts from this day on. Never let, never let it stop. Those that we care about the most who are lost, to pray for them, to seek their salvation, to weep over them. May you hear that. May you be gracious to save. Not just them, Lord, but those who are just acquaintances with, those whom we just work with, those whom we live down the street from, those whom we don't even know. I pray, God, you would give us hearts of care and concern for the lost who will perish without Christ and give us a heart of evangelism to share the good news with them today and every day. I pray it, Lord, in Jesus' name.